Hi, this is Michael Altos, and today we're starting our section on renal physiology. This is recording part one. The kidneys have many different functions in the body. We know they primarily act to rid the body of metabolic waste materials and toxins. This includes urea from amino acid metabolism, creatinine from muscle breakdown, uric acid from nucleic acid breakdown, and bilirubin from hemoglobin breakdown. The kidneys also regulate water and electrolyte balances and concentrations, adjusting them to match changes in intake. The kidneys regulate arterial pressure on the short term through the renin angiotensin system and on the long term through sodium and water regulation. The kidneys also regulate acid base balance through the excretion of acids and regulation of buffers. They also regulate erythrocyte production by secreting erythropoietin, which stimulates red blood cell production. And they also have a role in hormone and glucose secretion, including vitamin D formation and gluconeogenesis. Looking at the anatomy of the kidneys, we start with the glomerulus. This is a network of capillaries at the beginning of a nephron. Blood is filtered across capillary walls into a cup-like sac which is called Bowman's capsule. The filtrate then enters the renal tubule. The filtrate consists of water and most solutes, but it does not contain protein or any protein-bound solutes or cell components or most negatively charged molecules. The glomerulus receives its blood supply from the afferent arteriole, and it exits into the efferent arterioles rather than into venules. So this is a change from most capillary systems that we are familiar with. Now each kidney contains close to a million nephrons, and these structures cannot regenerate if they are ever destroyed. The kidney is responsible for excretion of substances. And excretion is a combination of three processes. Filtration, which is substance moving from the glomerular capillaries into Bowman's capsule. Reabsorption, which is substances moving back out from the nephron into the blood. And secretion, which is additional movement of substances from the peritubular capillaries into the renal tubules. And these three processes summed together equal excretion. A quick note about the anatomy of the urinary tract. The bladder is a smooth muscle chamber where urine collects after being drained by the ureters. Urine then exits the bladder through the urethra, and this structure is innervated by sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. Now, the glomerular filtration rate, or the GFR, describes the flow rate of filtered fluid through the kidney, and we use it as an assessment of renal function, which could impact our drug dosing. Normal GFR is 125 milliliters per minute, which equals 180 liters per day. Now this is not the same as renal blood flow. Renal blood flow is about a liter, it's 1100 milliliters per minute. That's about 22% of your cardiac output. And we know that of renal blood flow, some of that is blood cells. The portion that's plasma, or your renal plasma flow, could be calculated by figuring what percentage of your blood volume is not cells. So 1 minus the hematocrit times renal blood flow. And we get renal plasma flow of about 660 milliliters per minute. Now that's interesting because uh, GFR is only 125 milliliters per minute. It's only about 20% of your renal plasma flow. That's called your filtration fraction. Now of this 125 milliliters per minute, 124 of them per minute is reabsorbed, leaving a net urine output of about one milliliter per minute. Now what determines GFR? Primarily, it's determined by the hydrostatic and oncotic pressures, and these can vary in varying in different stages of health and disease. So what can make GFR become low? So a low filtration fraction 
and that would be in renal disease or diabetes where we have damage to the ability to filter substances across the glomerular membrane. We could have low hydrostatic pressure. That could be due to hypotension. It could be due to increased resistance at the afferent arterial, so we don't have a lot of flow into the glomerulus. Vasopressors and sympathetics can do that. It could be due to decreased resistance at the efferent arterial. So we have good flow in, but it flows out quickly and we don't build up a lot of hydrostatic pressure. Low levels of angiotensin II can cause that. Also, if there's a high plasma oncotic pressure, that will resist flow of fluid into Bowman's capsule. And then, of course, high pressure in Bowman's capsule, a high hydrostatic pressure, like urinary tract obstruction, will also cause a low GFR. Now, we said that hypotension can lead to low GFR, but fortunately, we have autoregulation in place. We've seen autoregulation elsewhere in our physiology studies. The same concept applies here. Autoregulation allows us to maintain constant renal blood flow and constant GFR despite significant changes in blood pressure over a range of mean arterial pressure of about 70 to 170. This is also accomplished through tubuloglomerular feedback. The way this process works is there are specialized cells called the macula densa, and they are in the kidney and they sense changes in sodium chloride and volume in the distal tubule. This leads to changes in the resistance of the afferent and efferent arterioles in order to adjust urine output and GFR. And they also cause release of renin from the juxtaglomerular cells. The net effect is that as mean arterial pressure goes up, urine output goes up in order to maintain a constant renal blood flow regardless of blood pressure within a normal physiologic range. The next topic we need to spend a moment on is clearance. Clearance is defined as the volume of plasma that is completely cleared of a substance by the kidneys per unit of time. Now this is a little bit of a theoretical idea because we know that when plasma goes through the kidneys it's not completely cleared of a substance but rather it's partially cleared and then it recycles and goes through again and again until it becomes cleared. But if we imagine that a substance exists in the plasma at a concentration of one milligram per milliliter, then if one milligram of substance enters the urine each minute, we can say it's as if one milliliter of plasma is completely cleared each minute, even though we know that's not exactly how it works. And so clearance gives us a sense of the kidney's function. If a substance is freely filtered and it isn't secreted or reabsorbed, then its rate of urinary excretion is equal to its renal filtration. And that would be a great way to measure GFR. The easiest way to do this is with creatinine, which is a byproduct of muscle metabolism. Creatinine clearance is not a perfect substitute for GFR because there is a little bit of secretion of creatinine into the renal tubules. But it's a pretty good approximation. So you can collect urine and measure urine creatinine and get a precise measurement or a very good approximation of, crea of uh, creatinine clearance and therefore GFR. Or you can do what we usually do, which is measuring plasma creatinine. And that should have an inverse relationship to GFR. If GFR decreases, we expect plasma creatinine to build up and to increase. Now, there are a lot of equations out there that you can use to estimate GFR and creatinine clearance, and I've provided some links in the notes for that. The cockroff galt equation was the best choice for medication dosing adjustments, but it isn't really recommended anymore, even though it's still probably accurate for most patients and most medications. In modern times, most people are using the CKD-EPI or the MDRD equations, and I've provided links to those equations as well. The bottom line is that drugs uh, with renal clearance may need an adjusted dosing regimen if the creatinine clearance in the patient is low.
That's the end of our first section on renal physiology. Please be in touch with me if you have questions about any of the material, and we'll see you in the next recording.